Chapter Thirteen. At your age, you would not take advantage of a defenceless woman," cried La Cibot, struggling in his arms. "Don't make a noise." "You too, the better one of the two," returned La Cibot. "Ah, it is my fault for talking about love to two old men who have never had nothing to do with women. I have roused your passions," cried she, as Schmucke's eyes glittered with wrath. "Help! Help! Police!" "You are a stupid," said the German. "Look here, what did the doctor say?" "You are a ruffian to treat me so," wept La Cibot, now released. "Me that would go through fire and water for you both." "Ah, well, well, they say that that is the way with men, and true it is. There is my poor Cibot. He would not be rough with me like this, and I treated you like my children, for I have none of my own. And yesterday, yes, only yesterday, I said to Cibot, God knew well what he was doing, dear, I said, when he refused us children, for I have two children there, upstairs. By the holy crucifix and the soul of my mother, that was what I said to him. Eh, yeah, but what did that doctor say? Schmucke demanded furiously, stamping on the floor for the first time in his life. Well, said Madame Cibot, drawing Schmucke into the dining room, he just said this that our dear darling love lying ill there would die if he wasn't carefully nursed. But I am here, in spite of all your brutality, for brutal you were, you that I thought so gentle, and you are one of that sort. Ah, now you would not abuse a woman at your age, great blackguard. Placard, I, will you not understand that I love nobody but Pons? Well and good, you will let me alone, won't you? said she, smiling at Schmucke. You had better, for if Cibot knew that anybody had attempted his honour, he would break every bone in his skin. Take great care of him, dear Montame Zipod answered schmucke and he tried to take the portress's hand oh look here now again just listen to me you shall have all that i have give thee save him very well i will go round to the chemist's to get the things that are wanted this illness is going to cost a lot you see sir and what will you do i shall work bons shall be nursed like ein prince so he shall monsieur schmucke and look here, don't you trouble about nothing. Cibot and I, between us, have saved a couple of thousand francs. They are yours. I have been spending money on you this long time, I have. Good woman, cried Schmucke, brushing the tears from his eyes. Wat ein heart. Wipe your tears, they do me honour. This is my reward, said La Cibot, melodramatically. There isn't no more disinterested creature on earth than me, but don't you go into the room with tears in your eyes, or Monsieur Pons will be thinking himself worse than he is. Schmucke was touched by this delicate feeling. He took La Cibot's hand and gave it a final squeeze. Spare me, cried the ex-oyster seller, leering at Schmucke. Pons, the good German said when he returned, Montame Zipod is an angel. "'Tis an angel that brattles, but an angel all the same. "'Do you think so? "'I have grown suspicious in the past month,' said the invalid, shaking his head. "'After all I have been through, one comes to believe in nothing but God and my friend.' "'Get better, and we will live like kings, all three of us,' exclaimed Schmucke. Cibot, panted the portress as she entered the lodge oh my dear our fortune is made my two gentlemen haven't nobody to come after them no natural children no nothing in short oh i shall go round to ma'am fontaine's and get her to tell my fortune on the cards then we shall know how much we are going to have wife said the little tailor it's ill counting on dead men's shoes oh i say are you going to worry me asked she giving her spouse a playful tap i know what i know dr poulain has given up monsieur pons and we are going to be rich my name will be down in the will i'll see to that draw your needle in and out and look after the lodge you will not do it for long now we will retire and go into the country out at batignolles 
a nice house and a fine garden you will amuse yourself with gardening and i shall keep a servant well neighbor and how are things going on upstairs the words were spoken with the thick auvergnat accent and remonenc put his head in at the door do you know what the collection is worth no no not yet one can't go at that rate my good man i have begun myself by finding out more important things more important exclaimed remonenc why what things can be more important come let me do the steering ragamuffin said la cibot authoritatively but thirty per cent on seven hundred thousand francs persisted the dealer in old iron you could be your own mistress for the rest of your days on that be easy daddy remonenc when we want to know the value of the things that the old man has got together then we will see la cibot went for the medicine ordered by dr poulain and put off her consultation with madame fontaine until the morrow the oracle's faculties would be fresher and clearer in the morning she thought and she would go early before everybody else came for there was often a crowd at madame fontaine's madame fontaine was at this time the oracle of the marais she had survived the rival of forty years the celebrated mademoiselle le normand no one imagines the part that fortune-tellers play among parisians of the lower classes nor the immense influence which they exert over the uneducated general servants portresses kept women workmen all the many in paris who live on hope consult the privileged beings who possess the mysterious power of reading the future the belief of the occult science is far more widely spread than scholars lawyers doctors magistrates and philosophers imagine the instincts of the people are ineradicable one among those instincts so foolishly styled superstition runs in the blood of the populace and tinges no less the intellects of better educated folk more than one french statesman has been known to consult the fortune-teller's cards for sceptical minds astrology in french so oddly termed astrologie judiciaire is nothing more than a cunning device for making a profit out of one of the strongest of all the instincts of human nature to wit curiosity the sceptical mind consequently denies that there is any connection between human destiny and the prognostications obtained by the seven or eight principal methods known to astrology and the occult sciences like many natural phenomena are passed over by the freethinker or the materialist philosopher it est by those who believe in nothing but visible and tangible facts in the results given by the chemist's retort and the scales of modern physical science the occult sciences still exist they are at work but they make no progress for the greatest intellects of two centuries have abandoned the field if you only look at the practical side of divination it seems absurd to imagine that events in a man's past life and secrets known only to himself can be represented on the spur of the moment by a pack of cards which he shuffles and cuts for the fortune-teller to lay out in piles according to certain mysterious rules but then the steam-engine was condemned as absurd aerial navigation is still said to be absurd so in their time were the inventions of gunpowder printing spectacles engraving and that latest discovery of all the daguerreotype if any man had come to napoleon to tell him that a building or a figure is at all times and in all places represented by an image in the atmosphere that every existing object has a spectral intangible double which may become visible the emperor would have sent his informant to charenton for a lunatic just as richelieu before his day sent that norman martyr salomon de caux to the bicetre for announcing his immense triumph the idea of navigation by steam yet daguerre's discovery amounts to nothing more nor less than this and if for some clairvoyant eyes god has written each man's destiny over his whole outward and visible form if a man's body is the record of his fate why should not the hand in a manner epitomize the body 
since the hand represents the deed of man and by his deeds he is known herein lies the theory of palmistry does not society imitate god at the sight of a soldier we can predict that he will fight of a lawyer that he will talk of a shoemaker that he shall make shoes or boots of a worker of the soil that he shall dig the ground and dung it and is it a more wonderful thing that such a one with the seer's gift should foretell the events of a man's life from his hand to take a striking example genius is so visible in a man that a great artist cannot walk about the streets of paris but the most ignorant people are conscious of his passing he is a sun as it were in the mental world shedding light that colors everything in its path and who does not know an idiot at once by an impression the exact opposite of the sensation of the presence of genius most observers of human nature in general and parisian nature in particular can guess the profession or calling of the man in the street the mysteries of the witch's sabbath so wonderfully painted in the sixteenth century are no mysteries for us the egyptian ancestors of that mysterious people of indian origin the gypsies of the present day simply used to drug their clients with hashish a practice that fully accounts for broomstick rides and flights up the chimney the real seeming visions so to speak of old crones transformed into young damsels the frantic dances the exquisite music and all the fantastic tales of devil worship so many proven facts have been first discovered by occult science that some day we shall have professors of occult science as we already have professors of chemistry and astronomy it is even singular that here in paris where we are founding chairs of manchu and slav and literatures so little professable to coin a word as the literatures of the north which so far from providing lessons stand very badly in need of them when the curriculum is full of the everlasting lectures on shakespeare and the sixteenth century it is strange that some one has not restored the teaching of the occult philosophies once the glory of the university of paris under the title of anthropology germany so childlike and so great has outstripped france in this particular in germany they have professors of a science of far more use than a knowledge of the heterogeneous philosophies which all come to the same thing at bottom once admit that certain beings have the power of discerning the future in its germ form of the cause as the great inventor sees a glimpse of the industry latent in his invention or a science in something that happens every day unnoticed by ordinary eyes once allow this and there is nothing to cause an outcry in such phenomena no violent exception to nature's laws but the operation of a recognized faculty possibly a kind of mental somnambulism as it were if therefore the hypothesis upon which the various ways of divining the future are based seems absurd the facts remain remark that it is not really more wonderful that the seer should foretell the chief events of the future than that he should read the past past and future on the skeptic system equally lie beyond the limits of knowledge if the past has left traces behind it it is not improbable that future events have as it were their roots in the present if a fortune-teller gives you minute details of past facts known only to yourself why should he not foresee the events to be produced by existing causes the world of ideas is cut out so to speak on the pattern of the physical world the same phenomena should be discernible in both allowing for the difference of the medium as for instance a corporeal body actually projects an image upon the atmosphere a spectral double detected and recorded by the daguerreotype so also ideas having a real and effective existence leave an impression as it were upon the atmosphere of the spiritual world 
they likewise produce effects and exist spectrally to coin a word to express phenomena for which no words exist and certain human beings are endowed with the faculty of discerning these forms or traces of ideas as for the material means employed to assist the seer the objects arranged by the hands of the consultant that the accidents of his life may be revealed to him this is the least inexplicable part of the process everything in the material world is part of a series of causes and effects nothing happens without a cause every cause is a part of a whole and consequently the whole leaves its impression on the slightest accident rabelais the greatest mind among moderns resuming pythagoras hippocrates aristophanes and dante pronounced three centuries ago that man is a microcosm a little world three hundred years later the great seer swedenborg declared that the world was a man the prophet and the precursor of incredulity meet thus in the greatest of all formulas everything in human life is predestined so it is also with the existence of the planet the least event the most futile phenomena are all subordinate parts of a scheme great things therefore great designs and great thoughts are of necessity reflected in the smallest actions and that so faithfully that should a conspirator shuffle and cut a pack of playing cards he will write the history of his plot for the eyes of the seer styled gypsy fortune-teller charlatan or what not if you once admit fate which is to say the chain of links of cause and effect astrology has a locus standi and becomes what it was of yore a boundless science requiring the same faculty of deduction by which cuvier became so great a faculty to be exercised spontaneously however and not merely in nights of study in the closet for seven centuries astrology and divination have exercised an influence not only as at present over the uneducated but over the greatest minds over kings and queens and wealthy people animal magnetism one of the great sciences of antiquity had its origin in occult philosophy chemistry is the outcome of alchemy phrenology and neurology are no less the fruit of similar studies the first illustrious workers in these to all appearance untouched fields made one mistake the mistake of all inventors that is to say they erected an absolute system on a basis of isolated facts for which modern analysis as yet cannot account the catholic church the law of the land and modern philosophy in agreement for once combined to proscribe persecute and ridicule the mysteries of the Kabbalah as well as the adepts the result is a lamentable interregnum of a century in occult philosophy but the uneducated classes and not a few cultivated people women especially continue to pay a tribute to the mysterious power of those who can raise the veil of the future they go to buy hope strength and courage of the fortune-teller in other words to ask of him all that religion alone can give so the art is still practised in spite of a certain amount of risk the eighteenth century encyclopedists procured tolerance for the sorcerer he is no longer amenable to a court of law unless indeed he lends himself to fraudulent practices and frightens his clients to extort money from them in which case he may be prosecuted on a charge of obtaining money under false pretenses unluckily the exercise of the sublime art is only too often used as a method of obtaining money under false pretenses and for the following reasons the seer's wonderful gifts are usually bestowed upon those who are described by the epithets rough and uneducated the rough and uneducated are the chosen vessels into which god pours the elixirs at which we marvel from among the rough and uneducated prophets arise an apostle peter or saint peter the hermit wherever mental power is imprisoned 
and remains intact and entire for want of an outlet in conversation in politics in literature in the imaginings of the scholar in the efforts of the statesman in the conceptions of the inventor or the soldier's toils of war the fire within is apt to flash out in gleams of marvellously vivid light like the sparks hidden in an unpolished diamond let the occasion come and the spirit within kindles and glows finds wings to traverse space and the godlike power of beholding all things the coal of yesterday under the play of some mysterious influence becomes a radiant diamond better educated people many-sided and highly polished continually giving out all that is in them can never exhibit this supreme power save by one of the miracles which god sometimes vouchsafes to work for this reason the soothsayer is almost always a beggar whose mind is virgin soil a creature coarse to all appearance a pebble borne along the torrent of misery and left in the ruts of life where it spends nothing of itself save in mere physical suffering the prophet the seer in short is some martin le laboureur making a louis the eighteenth tremble by telling him a secret known only to the king himself or it is a mademoiselle le normand or a domestic servant like madame fontaine or again perhaps it is some half idiotic negress some herdsman living among his cattle who receives the gift of vision some hindu fakir seated by a pagoda mortifying the flesh till the spirit gains the mysterious power of the somnambulist asia indeed through all time has been the home of the heroes of occult science persons of this kind recovering their normal state are usually just as they were before they fulfill in some sort the chemical and physical functions of bodies which conduct electricity at times inert metal at other times a channel filled with a mysterious current in their normal condition they are given to practices which bring them before the magistrate yea verily like the notorious balthazar even unto the criminal court and so to the hulks you could hardly find a better proof of the immense influence of fortune-telling upon the working classes than the fact that poor Ponce's life and death hung upon the prediction that madame fontaine was to make from the cards although a certain amount of repetition is inevitable in a canvas so considerable and so full of detail as a complete picture of french society in the nineteenth century it is needless to repeat the description of madame fontaine's den already given in les comediens sans le savoir suffice it to say that madame cibot used to go to madame fontaine's house in the rue vieille du temple as regularly as frequenters of the cafe anglais drop in at that restaurant for lunch madame cibot being a very old customer often introduced young persons and old gossips consumed with curiosity to the wise woman the old servant who acted as provost marshal flung open the door of the sanctuary with no further ceremony than the remark it's madame cibot come in there's nobody here well child what can bring you here so early of a morning asked the sorceress as madame fontaine might well be called for she was seventy-eight years old and looked like one of the parsi something has given me a turn said la cibot i want the grand jeu it is a question of my fortune therewith she explained her position and wished to know if her sordid hopes were likely to be realized do you know what the grand jeu means asked madame fontaine with much solemnity no i haven't never seen the trick i am not rich enough a hundred francs it's not as if it cost so much where was the money to come from but now i can't help myself i must have it i don't do it often child returned madame fontaine i only do it for rich people on great occasions and they pay me twenty-five louis for doing it it tires me you see it wears me out the spirit rives my inside here it is like going to the sabbath as they used to say 
but when i tell you that it means my whole future my dear good ma'am fontaine well as it is you that have come to consult me so often i will submit myself to the spirit replied madame fontaine with a look of genuine terror on her face she rose from her filthy old chair by the fireside and went to a table covered with a green cloth so worn that you could count the threads a huge toad sat dozing there beside a cage inhabited by a black dishevelled-looking fowl astaroth here my son she said and the creature looked up intelligently at her as she wrapped him on the back with a long knitting needle and you mademoiselle cleopatre attention she continued tapping the ancient fowl on the beak then madame fontaine began to think for several seconds she did not move she looked like a corpse her eyes rolled in their sockets and grew white then she rose stiff and erect and a cavernous voice cried here i am automatically she scattered millet for cleopatra took up the pack of cards shuffled them convulsively and held them out to madame cibot to cut sighing heavily all the time at the sight of that image of death in the filthy turban and uncanny-looking bed-jacket watching the black fowl as it pecked at the millet grains calling to the toad astaroth to walk over the cards that lay out on the table a cold thrill ran through madame cibot she shuddered nothing but strong belief can give strong emotions an assured income to be or not to be that was the question